Uh, greetings. Good to see everyone here tonight. And by say good to see everyone, I can't see any of you. It's just there's a glow because I'm being blinded. But it's good to know that you're here uh, this evening. And uh, whether you're here uh, in the building or in the hall or streaming on online, we pray that you would be encouraged as we seek to worship God together. We welcome to the pulpit this evening uh, Freddie Manet, who's a student at the Reformed Theological College. And thank you, Freddie, for uh, leading us in and opening the word tonight. Just a few notices before we begin our time. Uh, after the evening service tonight, uh, young adults uh, young adults are invited to go to the home of Josh and Lucilla Feldman uh, for second Sunday supper with session and we really encourage young adults to go and be a part of that. Um, and don't forget the next Lord's Day as well. Next Lord's Day as well, uh, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper, Lord's Supper together. And so it'd be good to prepare for that and uh, both spiritually and uh, also think about how you may contribute to a shared lunch if you're able to do that also following our service next Lord's Day. Sunday School and Adult Bible Class resume again next Lord's Day morning as well and that starts at 9.30 in the morning uh, prior to the morning service. Let's take a moment now, a moment now to prepare our hearts and minds to worship God.
Well, good evening. As always, it's a privilege to lead you in worship. Uh, please stand for the, the call to worship. Our call to worship this evening comes from First Chronicles chapter 16, uh, verses 23 to 29, which says, Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the earth, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. And we will respond to that using uh, Psalm 145a. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we do praise you. We thank you that we can gather as your people once more this day. We do pray now that you will be with us. We pray that you will bless us. We pray that you will keep our minds focused upon you. We pray that you will help us to give up the cares of this week that have been and the cares of the week to come for this moment and time that we may focus. Uh, and Lord, we pray that your spirit will truly work among us and he will meet us where we are, whether we are spiritually weary, spiritually uh, joyful, uh, Lord, or spiritually lost. We pray that your spirit will not return to you void as we know that he will not. And we pray all this now in Christ's name. Amen. I think if you were to ask a bunch of Christians their top five psalms, I suspect Psalm 23 would probably be, be on that list. And perhaps even for many non-Christians actually know this psalm fairly well. And it's sort of not hard to see why, is it? Psalm 23 opens with the beautiful words and the comforting words of God leading and caring for us as his sheep. It's, uh, it's, it's good to sort of run to these words often if you've had a difficult day or week uh, and you need a need of comfort in, in knowing that the Lord loves you and sees you, even in the darkest of your times of your life, as the psalm reminds us. 
And yet there's even more to the psalm than sometimes I think we realize. It's sort of the, the second half of the psalm moves to God setting a table, preparing a table before us, and blessing his children beyond what we can imagine as we dwell in the presence of the Lord. And this sort of pulls on the idea of, you know, sort of a covenantal meal with the Lord, reminding us of his promises uh, that he's to preserve and keep his children. And, and dwelling uh, in his presence, of course, is the goal of our faith, you know, that we'll be redeemed and restored to live with God in peace and security for all eternity. So we're going to stand and, and, and now sing this psalm together, asking for the Lord to continue to lead us and preserve us as he's promised. And in this, I trust we'll find hope and comfort. Let's sing Psalm 23b. Get you all singing at me. It sounds really wonderful, eh? And I feel sorry for the front row who have to listen to me. Uh, we're going to have our scripture reading. It's from Romans 7. Uh, this is marked as our text, and that's actually my fault. It's not our text. This is a support reading. But that's all right, because I've also changed the text around anyway. So um, so uh, we've got George to come up and read for us and pray for us. Uh, so in Romans 7, we're sort of looking at Paul's struggle in his inner life as he contemplates the the sin that remains, and, and the you know, desire to be free of it, as it ties in with our passage later on. So thanks, George. We're reading from Romans chapter 7, uh, yes, chapter 7, and starting at verse 7 to the end of the chapter. 
What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet. If the law had not said, you shall not covet, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandments, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. We finish our reading at the end of this chapter. Brothers and sisters, I now have the privilege to lead us in prayer. Shall we come to the Lord in our prayer? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, through the work and obedience of your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you in humble praise at this time of worship. We come to you knowing full well that you have called us here at this time and at this place. And so we do want to bring you the honour and glory that you deserve and ask of us. We know, Lord, that it may be imperfect and not what it should be, but we also know that you are a loving Father and a patient God who looks at us not at what we deserve but on what Christ has done for us. We pray that the truth of the gospel may speak to us as we face this coming week, as we go through this week examining ourselves and looking forward to celebrating the Lord's Supper together, being reminded of the cost that was paid to set us free. 
Lord, we ask, continue to bless us, we pray, as we spend this time in worship. And we ask, too, that you may give Freddie all he needs as he has prepared to preach to us your word in all its fullness and love. May your Holy Spirit help us all to understand and apply that word to us all in whatever situation or circumstance we find ourselves. So we pray for all, whether that be in the hall or online at this time. But Lord, we pray particularly for Lester and Ruth Barclay, the things that they do and the, the involvement they are involved, we pray that that not, may not always be seen in public or be obvious, but this contribution is much appreciated in the different situations. And so, Lord, we pray also and continue to pray that you may watch over them. We pray that too for Margaret Bell, Lord. We all look forward to getting older, but it does not mean it gets easier for us. And so, Lord, we pray that you may continue to be with Margaret also as she continues to love and serve you. And this evening, Lord, we also want to mention Malachi Vickery. Lord, it's a young baby that's going through a hard time. And Lord, it, the uncertainty of it makes all of us as parents concerned for such a young child. But we pray that the outcome may be positive and that the biopsy may prove to be something that can easily be uh, healed through uh, medication or an operation. Lord, we pray, strengthen and guide Malachi as young as he is, but also give comfort and assurance to the parents. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray for people that we know of, and some of us may know other people that are not mentioned tonight who face a week of uncertainty and worry. And Lord, we pray that you may also remember them in this coming week. May they feel your comfort and nearness and assurance that they belong to you and that no matter what happens and what the outcome is of certain things in their lives, that they belong to you and they, are your, they are, belong to you in the name of Christ our Saviour. So, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity and we pray all this in the precious name of Christ who is our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Thank you, George. Uh, we'll now take up our, our tithes and offerings. So if you're a visitor here, please don't feel obligation to give, but you are also welcome to as well. Uh, we'll sing while we do that uh, Psalm 24a.
as we come to the reading and preaching of the word, let's come for the Lord in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we've just sung your praises. We have sung that it is only you who is worthy. And yet, Lord, through your Son, you have made us worthy to enter in your presence. We pray now that you'd give us ears to hear and eyes to see the spiritual truths of your word. We pray all this now in Christ's name. Amen. Um, yes, our text is going to be Philippians chapter 2. Initially, I had intended to be verses 2 to uh, 18, and then I started writing the sermon. And by the end of verse 13, I realized you want to go home. So our text will be verses 12 to 13, but I'm going to read uh, from the beginning of the chapter through to verse 18. So Philippians chapter 2. It's on page 1248 in the Pew Bibles. Yeah. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. In our text, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Thus far our reading. I wonder what you find the most frustrating thing about being a Christian. Perhaps it's uh, wondering why God doesn't uh, do something about all the unchristians around us. You know, convert them. Perhaps it's the frustration of being mocked or looked down upon for your faith by your friends or colleagues. I mean, it's hardly a barrel of laughs, is it? Or maybe it's the frustration of your life and the realization that God could make your life really easy with just the click of a fingers. So why doesn't he? So while all these very real struggles that we, we have, I'm sure, at times, uh, I wonder whether there is maybe or perhaps a deeper, more difficult struggle for all of us. Uh, Paul speaks of this in his uh, passage in Romans 7 that we read, where he calls himself a wretched man and he cries out for help. And what was it that frustrated him so much? It was the sin which remains in him, the sin which he does not want to do and yet finds himself doing, that, that evil that lies close at hand even as he does what is right. You know, seeking just for a moment to, to jump in and make the good that he's doing uh, become twisted through perhaps him having a wrong motive. So for Paul, the great frustration of being a Christian is the remaining sin in his life. Despite loving God and his law and his inner being, he still has sinful desires and sinful actions which he can't seem to shake, and in fact, which wages war against his soul. And it's Romans 7 verse 22 where he says that. So I wonder whether you can resonate with this. As you look at your life, you, you see a love for God flowering and growing as you delight in all that God has done in your life. And yet, that moment is quickly trod on as you yourself 
find yourself the next moment flying off the handle in anger at somebody or gossiping about another person who's done something wrong to you or desiring and lusting after things that, as Christians, we don't want to admit to. You know, one moment you're serving God and his church, and the next being selfish and heartless both to God and his people. Now, I don't know about you, but I see this frustration, frustrating truth in my own life, as at times it's sort of, I feel a bit like a spiritual Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, or for the, for the younger ones here who like Marvel, perhaps more like uh, Venom, you know, who is a man who gets taken over by an alien species that makes him do bad things. You know, so I find myself wanting to do what's right, and yet so easily giving in to sin. And so what we're talking about here is sort of the fight, the battle, which is sanctification. And in our passage today, we're going to think about just who is responsible for our sanctification. Is it ourselves, or is it God? Now, for many, this seems a bit like a contradiction. Yet I think we will see, by thinking about this passage, that it's not. So to help us think about it, we're going to look at the two sides of the coin of sanctification. And our passage begins in verse 12 with, therefore. Now Paul does this because what he is going to say next, a command, is grounded in the fact of what he's just said earlier in chapter 2, in verses 5 to 12. And this is what Paul often does. Any command or imperative, go and do this, is grounded in the indicative or the facts. So what fact is Paul reminding of us? Us of, sorry. He's calling our attention back to the, the beautiful Christological truths that he's just said. That, that Christ let go of all his rights as God to come and serve us by dying for us. And he did this willingly and he did it obediently to his Father. And after giving this most precious sacrifice, how God raised our Savior and elevated him to the heights of heaven, where he has been glorified above all and will be praised by all. And it's to this God-man that we've been joined, to our Lord Jesus Christ. In him, we've had our sins paid for by his blood. In him, we, have our, uh, we will be raised to a new life for all eternity. In him, we will one day reign with him over the new creation uh, where God makes all things new. And all this because Christ was willing for our sakes to do the unthinkable, to humble himself and in obedience die for us. And it's with all this in mind that Paul says in verse 12, Therefore, because of these great and glorious facts, these great truths, What does he say? He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, there are a bunch of things that we need to understand about this phrase in this verse. And the first is that he is talking to believers, as he calls them, my beloved. So this is a term, a sort of affectionate endearment. He's moved by the truths of Christ that he's just been thinking about. He calls the Philippians, my beloved. You can almost sort of hear the echo of uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20. You know, you're not your own. You've been brought with a price. Your believers are precious and beloved to Christ. And so they are precious and beloved by Paul. And they should be precious and beloved by us. So this is important because what Paul is about to tell us is only possible for believers to obey. And they need to uh, obey like Christ. And here Paul uses the sort of the same word of Christ's obedience for our obedience. In other words, the command Paul is giving us is one which should be obeyed in all humility like Jesus did. It should be obeyed in the same self-denying, God-honoring way that Jesus showed us. And it should be done in a way that doesn't matter who's watching. Paul tells them to obey just as much with him gone as when he's present. I, I don't know about you, but I always found it really easy as a boy to obey my mother when she told me to do something, when she was standing nearby with a wooden spoon in a back pocket. Now, funnily enough, sort of no ideas of disobedience ever entered my mind at those moments. But the moment that she would leave, those uh, rebellious thoughts would sort of come rushing back in uh, like magic out of thin air. And Paul says, don't obey like this. Obey whether I am there or not. 
Don't let your obedience flag just because I'm not present. And this is why Paul calls us to the obedience of Christ. Obedience when no one's looking. Obedience when Jesus could have just got out of it and stopped. It's this type of obedience that we need to work out our salvation with. And here we encounter a bit of a problem. What does it mean to work out your own salvation? This sort of feels a little bit like a, a phrase that you almost want to get your scissors and start cutting it out because you're not sure. Surely Paul doesn't mean save yourselves, does he? Well, have no fear. You can, you can leave your scissors in the drawer or wherever it was that your kids or husband last left them. You see, when the New Testament talks of salvation, it often has a broader meaning than just the act of conversion. Rather, it encompasses the whole process of God saving you from the moment of your conversion right up until the moment that you wake up in glory with Christ upon your death and everything in between. So this whole, we often sort of break the stages of salvation down into three parts. Uh, we call it justification, sanctification, and glorification. Now, justification and glorification uh, is solely the work of God. While the act of sanctification, as we're going to see, is something that we are to be involved in, something we cooperate with God over. So what is sanctification? Uh, it's the process of being uh, progressively uh, saved from the power and practice of sin. So the process of being progressively saved from the power and practice of sin. And in this work of being saved, we are called to action. We are called to work. Now, it's important to notice that other little word in there, to work out. We are to work out our salvation. You see, our sanctification does not come from us. Sorry, I just lost my spot. Well, we'll see in the next verse that our sanctification we are to work out is actually what God has already worked in. So in other words, in working out, working on being more righteous and turning from sin in our lives, we're not saving ourselves at all. Rather, we are responding to and doing what God has placed in us. Our work flows from the source, which is God. So what are we, what are we to do with this? What does it mean to work out your salvation? Well, this calls for spiritual action. It's, it's not okay as a Christian to think that once I've been converted, all I have to do is put my spiritual feet up and wait for God's salvation tour bus to take me to glory. A sort of let go and let God kind of idea. This call to action can be seen in other passages as well. So you could look at James 4 verse 7, which, which says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So there the focus being on, on resisting the devil. Or you can look at 1 Timothy 4 verse 7, where Paul tells Timothy, Have nothing to do with irrelevant silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. So again, we're not talking about earning salvation in the ultimate sense here. We're talking about growing in what your salvation means, to become more like Christ. And this is going to take work. Spiritual couch potatoes don't grow very much in grace and holiness. Now, you might not be able to tell, but I actually am training for a half marathon in July. Now, I wonder how well I would go if between now and then I didn't do a single bit of running or exercise. I suspect by one kilometre in, I'd be puffing pretty heavily. Perhaps by three, I'd have stitch and be pretty sore. And by five, probably a heart attack would be my, my thoughts. So if we want to be physically fit, we're going to need to train. The same is true for our spirituality. Sitting on our spiritual backsides will not grow us in holiness. It takes hard work to pray, immerse ourselves in the Word, and obey Jesus and all that God has called us to. Now, at this point, we're going to have to be very careful of two dangers. On the one hand, we need to be very careful that we don't sort of blunt the force of this command by sort of rushing to verse 13 and look at God's work. 
No, Paul is calling for serious effort and work in our Christian lives. We are to live rich, fully orbed, uh, godly lives of obedience, growing in prayer and love for God and his people. And when we see sin in our lives, we're not just sort of, sort of shrug and be, oh, oh, well, over to you, God, I, I can't deal with this. I mean, it would be a little bit like an alcoholic who wants to change but keeps walking past the, the bottle store on his way home and not changing his route. Or, or the person struggling with porn who won't put restrictions on their devices because, wow, I should just be strong enough to resist. This just doesn't work. No, we need to go after sin and we need to attack it head on. We need to take steps, if necessary, to achieve this. So that's one danger, to reduce what Paul is saying because of God's grace, which is coming. <laughs> but the other danger is, of course, that of legalism, where we, start to see, we see all this command and we suddenly think that now we must be good enough for God. And if we do that, then we're going to sink slowly under the weight of God's law as we realize we do not measure up. And we try and fix it by praying more, reading more, just you know, doing more. Perhaps you know, just need to be more self-disciplined and need to struggle more against the evil and bring the good. But what's the result of this sort of legalism, legalistic approach? It really is a, a joyless Christianity as we struggle to achieve a level of obedience that we hope will win God's approval. We either end up smug in self-righteousness or depressed because of our failure, or perhaps just yo-yoing back and forth between the two. So if we're to take Paul seriously and obey this command, how can we work out our salvation and avoid these dangers? And I think the answer really lies uh, in, in the next little phrase in our, our verse there, in fear and trembling. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. You see, it's as we are in awe of God and what he has done for us that we stay motivated rightly. It's as we look at our great God who has redeemed us and loves us uh, that we want to obey him. And as we see that we have done nothing for our salvation and you have been given everything uh, by our gracious Father. And yet God is not just a sort of a, a soft teddy bear who hands out cuddles of grace. No, God hates sin. And he hates sin absolutely. And he hates sin in his people, in you and in me. In fact, God's hatred of sin is what drove him to bring Christ to the cross for us. So this should motivate us, this should move us to a holy, reverential trembling before our holy God as we see our great need of his continued grace. A big view of God leads to a big view of obedience. So, so let me ask you, what effort are you putting in to your spiritual growth? Is this something that's sort of big on your radar? Now, now please, as, as I say this, Realize I'm preaching to myself. As I prepared for this uh, uh, message this week, I, this was very confronting to myself to realize the sin in my own life. You know, there's things that I need to recalibrate in my life, things which uh, aren't focused on spiritual go growth. In fact, things which may be getting in the way. But if we're to take Paul seriously, we need to hear what he's saying. It doesn't matter where you are today in your spiritual walk whether you're a senior or junior or fresh convert or somewhere in between. We all need to grow in this. We need to keep growing in this. And this text encourages and exhorts you to put time and energy into your spiritual growth. So will you obey this call? Are you willing to train your spiritual muscles? Now, this is a high call to, to, to grow in holiness, and if we were to stop here in the sermon, it would be pretty easy to become despondent, wouldn't it? You know, as we look at our lives and realize how far we still have to go with our walk with the Lord and the frustration of continual failures. And it would be a mistake to end here also because the truth is, if our sanctification rested or relied on us, boy, are we in trouble. And thankfully, though, Paul doesn't stop there, does he? Uh, chapter, verse 12 is followed by verse 13 in which he tells us that in working out our salvation, we are not alone and we never were. Our growth does not rely on us. And here we're going to look at the other side of the coin. We're going to look at God's action in sanctification. 
In verse 13, Paul tells us the great truth of this whole thing. It is God who works in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, I don't know if you've ever been a, to a Christian conference, a weekend or a week, or a camp, and while you're there, your faith is flan, fan, uh, fanned into flame, and your desire to live for God grows to an all-time high. And then the camp or the conference ends, you go home, and suddenly you feel quenched, and that desire dies off as you get back into your normal life, and the reality of sin and life overwhelms you as you fall back into old habits. Yeah, so for a moment, we felt like God was working and he was doing something. And now perhaps, maybe not. And Paul says, no, God has worked, God will work, and God is always working in us, in his people. And the verb here that's used for working is, is a word that's uh, continuous action. It never stops, and it has no end. It's also the word that we get the English word of energy from. God is working, he's energizing our spiritual life. He's actively involved at all times in the souls of his children, even when we don't feel like it. So how does this work? How, how can we be working on one hand, but God also working in us as well? I've, I've tried to come up with a bit of an analogy. I sort of think I think it's helpful, but if it's not, just ignore it. But we'll, we'll try it. So think of it this way. Imagine that our hearts are bank accounts. And when God saved us, we were all in debt. Our numbers were well into the red. But once Christ has saved us and paid off that debt, not only do we not go to zero, but God actually puts a huge deposit in our hearts, his grace. And our role is to, to grow this deposit, to work with and cooperate with the grace in our lives. We're to invest in it, we're to develop it, we're to you know, tend it, we're to work with it, we're to you know, really focus on it. And we can do this by obedience to God and his word and by rooting out the sin which remains in us. And all this is, has to be done, of course, with the cooperation of the Holy Spirit. Now, we can certainly misuse the deposit or we can just let it sit idly by. But any progress or growth is only possible because of God's deposit in the first place and his continued work in us by his Holy Spirit. So without this, we would remain forever in debt and in the red. And what verse 13 is telling us is that our efforts in obedience will be effective because it is God who's energizing those efforts. And not only has God given us new hearts full of grace, which want to obey him, but through the Holy Spirit, he's also empowering our will and our doing of that obedience in the first place. And this is important because we need his energizing in both our will and our doing. And Paul talked about that in Romans 7. You know, I want to do this, but I find myself doing this. He needs God's work through both. You know, to, to, do anything, uh, uh, yeah, to do anything needs a couple of ingredients. Whether you want to mow the lawns, cook dinner, or do homework, to actually carry out your goal, you have to want to do it, or at least decide you must do it. <laughs> Uh, but only after your will is in place can you go and do it. And it's no good to want to do something and then never do it. And it's also very difficult to do anything that you don't want to do. Some of my last essays feel a bit like that. So what we need, we need God to be involved in the entire process of sanctification, in our wills and our carrying out the action. Otherwise, it will fail. And this shows us also that any work we do in our spiritual life does not merit us anything because it is God doing it. Any growth in your life is thanks to God, not yourself. It's his deposit and work in you. And this is why Paul writes this passage here. It's connected inseparably from the work of Christ that we've considered already. Jesus' work in uh, the earlier part of this passage is a comprehensive work. He not only rescued us from the power of sin, but also from its grip, its power of control over us. On the cross, he paid for our sin, what we call justification. And he did this without us. But in our sanctification, our process of being saved from the power and practice of sin, 
Jesus does this through us. We are involved. And he does this, of course, through his Holy Spirit who enlivens and energizes us to work and act and grow in grace and holiness. And he does all this, Jesus does all this for a great purpose, the highest motivation, because it brings pleasure to God. It brings pleasure to God when we, his children, obey him. It brings pleasure to God when we lovingly turn from sin and can't become more like his son. I don't know about you, but I love the idea of God watching on, watching you, watching me, living in obedience to him and growing in grace and God looking on and smiling at us. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful image, isn't it? And you see, God is in the business of making us more into his children, more into his family day by day. And this is, of course, the purpose of our sanctification, that bit by bit, uh, little bit by little bit, we begin to look more like our older brother, Jesus, and to, so, so that we could look more and more like the children of God that we are. So, so what are we to do with all this? What are we to do with this wonderful truth of our work, but also a God working through us? Well, firstly, uh, this should encourage us. In the journey of our Christian life, we are not alone. We cannot and do not go through it in our own strength. As we at times struggle with the frustration of sin, the frustration of black backsliding, the frustration of not being spiritually where we wish that we were, or even those times when we feel that God is far away, then know that Jesus is right there working in you through his Spirit. He will not let even one of those he loves fail to reach glory. There's also this passage does call us to action. Through God's power, we need to take this call to holiness seriously. So whether you're in the spiritual doldrums or the spiritual high at the moment, the call is to keep working and growing in your obedience to God. And as we do this, we, we must look expectantly to Christ to energize and move our will and our actions to work to God and for God. And when we obey, it's amazing to see what God does in our lives. Though often, it's only as you look backwards that you can see how far God has brought you. And remember, chasing holiness, pursuing sanctification is a worthwhile venture as it will bring a joy and a peace to your life that is beyond understanding. And it does this because it brings pleasure to God to see his children grow. And it brings pleasure to us as we are restored to the people we are meant to be and long to be. And what kind of people are we meant to be? We're meant to be people who work out what God has worked in. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this wonderful passage. Uh, Lord, just two little verses, uh, and they are so rich with meaning. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would help us to think about what they mean. Lord, we pray that we would uh, realize that anything we do must be done empowered, energized by you. Uh, and yet, Lord, we pray that we would indeed take holiness seriously, that we would desire to grow more into your children. Uh, Lord, we do pray now that you will uh, bless your word. In Christ's name, amen. Now, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I'll encourage you tonight perhaps to um, go home for a little bit of homework and look at those verses from 14 to 18. Because Paul actually works out what growing in sanctification looks like in a very practical way. I found five things in those verses, which I think Paul is, sort of shows us what sanctification looks like. So see if you can find them or, or do better. Uh, in response to the singing, uh, the, the preaching, we're going to stand and sing Psalm 119 in. And here we're singing about God's law being a light to our feet and giving us guidance.
receive now the parting blessing of the Lord. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.